If you are with us for the first or perhaps the second time this morning, I want to welcome you. We are uh, taking a break, really, from our exposition of First Peter in order uh, to look at the five solas of the Reformation. If you remember, October 31st, uh, not too far from now, is the celebration of when Luther posted those 95 theses and ignited a Reformation. The five solas, if you're not familiar with them, are these, sola scriptura, scripture alone, solus Christus Christ alone, sola gratia, by grace alone, sola fide, by faith alone, and soli deo gloria, to God's glory alone. Well, today we come to sola fide, faith alone. Celebrations of the 16th century reformation of what uh, happened from that point forward typically revolve around the larger than life figure of Martin Luther, one who we have been focusing on in the last couple of weeks. But this morning, I would like to wind the clock forward a little bit, really two decades after Luther had posted those 95 theses on that church door. And I want to draw your attention to John Calvin once again. If you remember from last week, we looked at Calvin and his understanding of God's grace. This week, I want to introduce faith alone by looking to a little debate between Calvin and a cardinal by the name of Sadaletto. This debate sometimes is overlooked when we look back to the 16th century, but actually it says a lot about what the Reformation was all about. Well, the year was 1539, and Cardinal Sadaletto, a bishop in southern France, wrote a letter. And he wrote this letter to the magistrates and citizens in Geneva. If you remember, Geneva was the place where Calvin was pastor. And his purpose in writing this letter was simple enough. He was writing to the Genevans, seeking to persuade them to return back to Rome. Come back to Rome, he said. And his letter was quite timely, very timely indeed. Previously, John Calvin, and if you remember that red-headed, uh, fiery preacher who convinced Calvin to stay in Geneva, Pharrell, well, they were banished. They were kicked out of Geneva, literally, exiled from the pulpit, all due to conflict they had with the civil authorities when it came to church authority and reform. And so Sadaletto saw this as the perfect opportunity. What a better time to write to the Genevans and to tell them, come back. Come back home to Rome. Well, the council that received his letter, Sadaletto's letter in Geneva, well, they were committed to the Protestant Reformation, despite everything that had happened with Calvin and his exile from Geneva. But they struggled, they really struggled to find someone who was worthy to respond to Sadaletto, a theologian perhaps that was worthy of this task. Not anyone would do. They needed someone to speak for them. After all, Calvin had been kicked out. And as a result, there were few there that could answer with the voice that Calvin had to some of these arguments in this letter. And so the letter that Sadaletto wrote was sent to Bern, who assured the Genevan magistrates that an appropriate responder would be found. Someone would be re recruited. Well, even though he was exiled, Calvin was the obvious choice. There is irony here. Once agreed upon, the letter was sent to Calvin in Strasbourg, 
who would take but six days to respond with a letter of his own. I want to focus for just a second on Sadaletto's plea in his letter. What is he saying to the Genevans to try to persuade them to come back to Rome, return to Roman Catholicism? What is he saying? Well, these two letters back and forth between Calvin and Sadaletto, they really reflect the two crucial issues, one of which we've looked at already, the two crucial issues of that day. One was the authority of Scripture, and the second was the doctrine that we are justified by faith alone. Notice, these were the same issues, aren't they? The same issues that were at stake in Luther's arguments and in his confrontation with the church of his day, just two decades earlier. Well, what did Sadaletto argue? He argued that the Genevans had really departed from the one true church which cannot err. They had abandoned this church. And according to him, Calvin and the reformers had torn apart the spouse of Christ, tearing it into pieces. But now the Genevans, with Calvin gone, had the opportunity of a lifetime. Here was the opportunity to come back to the one true church who had the one true interpretation of Scripture. But there was more to the argument than that. Sadaletto scoffed at the Reformation idea that a person is justified before God by faith alone. Sola fide, he scoffed at it. Remember, by reading the book of Romans, Luther came to discover, in contrast to Rome, he came to discover that a sinner is not justified by faith plus good works. As if good works could somehow merit or earn God's favor. No, Luther said, the sinner is justified before God by faith alone. Through faith, and Calvin is going to pick up on this, through faith in Christ, the sinner not only has his sins forgiven, washed away, but he has given to him the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. A righteousness that is imputed, credited to his account. Upon faith in Jesus alone, God then declares that sinner not guilty, but righteous. Not on the basis of anything the sinner has done, purely on the basis of what Christ has done. And so while good works are very important, they're not the basis on which one is justified. They're always the fruit, the result that God has justified the sinner. Sadaletto, like other Catholics of his day, rejected this Protestant teaching of faith alone, sola fide. Yes, said Sadaletto, we obtain the blessing of complete and perpetual salvation by faith alone in God and in Jesus Christ, he said. But Sadaletto was very quick to clarify that when he says faith alone, he does not mean a mere confidence in God, apart from good works. For Sadaletto, faith or trust in God is necessary, but it is not enough to be justified before God. One must perform 
good works. Well, how did Calvin reply to this very persuasive and strong argument written to these Genevans? Calvin's reply, I think, demonstrates just how important this doctrine of faith alone is. Justification, which we'll talk about in a minute, justification, says Calvin, is the first and keenest subject of controversy between us. Wherever sola fide is abandoned, the glory of Christ, he said, is extinguished. Religion abolished. The church destroyed. And the hope of salvation utterly overthrown. You feel the weight of sola fide? Sola fide is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. Calvin would say it's the very hinge on which Christianity turns. Like the Apostle Paul in Romans and Ephesians and Galatians, Calvin begins, like we saw from last week, he begins with man's own depravity. That's where he starts. That man is guilty before a holy God. Calvin bids every man to examine himself and he will be confounded and amazed at his misery. Is that you? All self-confidence, he says, will be abandoned when you do so. Why? Because you've given up. You, 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 have, you have realized that you are given up to final perdition, he said. You stand before a holy God, guilty. Guilty. It's only when we realize this, when we put aside our pride and our self-righteousness, and we realize, like Isaiah did, I am unclean. I'm undone before a holy God. It's only then that the sinner will understand, as Calvin said, that the only haven of safety is in the mercy of God as manifested in Christ in whom every part of our salvation is complete. Doesn't Calvin sound a lot like Luther before him? I want you to listen. This is on your outline. But I want you to listen here to this paragraph in Calvin in his writings, I want you to listen to what Calvin has to say about this. He says, as all mankind are in the sight of God, lost sinners, we hold that Christ is their only righteousness. Since by his obedience, he has wiped off our transgressions. By his sacrifice, appease the divine anger by his blood washed away our stains, by his cross borne our curse, and by his death made satisfaction for us. We maintain that in this way man is reconciled in Christ to God, to God the Father, by no merit of his own by no value of works, but by gratuitous mercy. When we embrace Christ by faith and come, as it were, into communion with him, this we term after the manner of scripture, the righteousness of faith. In my opinion, this is one of the greatest descriptions that we receive on this doctrine of faith alone. But not just faith alone, Christ alone. 
Christ's atoning sacrifice, which satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf, is the sole basis on which we are justified. It's not on the basis of any of our own merit, any of our own good works that we have accomplished, but purely and only because Christ laid down his life. It's only because of God's mercy in Christ that the sinner is declared righteous before God. It's not our obedience, but the obedience of Jesus. It's his obedience that is our only righteousness. Notice, there's no room left, is there? There's no room left. When it comes to justification, there's no room left for our works. As if we could somehow merit by our own works God's favor. Scripture teaches everywhere, says Calvin, that we're hopeless, we're lost. And our conscience bitterly accuses us, as Paul talks about in Romans. Our only hope is the mere goodness of God by which sin is pardoned and righteousness is imputed to us. That's our only hope. But what righteousness is this that Scripture says is then given to us? What is this righteousness if it's not our own? Calvin reminds us that it's an alien righteousness. It doesn't come from within us. It comes outside of us, apart from us. It's the righteousness of Jesus. It's His righteousness given to us. And so our reconciliation to a holy God is to be found not within ourselves, but in the gospel of Jesus Christ. With this debate between Calvin and Satellito in mind, these letters taking place in the church right in the middle of this, which, by the way, the church did not, the Genevans did not return to Rome. They did listen to Calvin. With this debate in mind, I want to turn your attention to the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And I want to define it just briefly by looking to what the Apostle Paul says. We already saw from Galatians earlier in the service what Paul has to say in Galatians, but I want to look now to the book of Romans. But let me ask this question to begin with. What is justification? What is justification? Maybe you've never heard that word before, or maybe you've heard it, but you're not familiar with it. What is justification? Well, justification, if I could just put this very simply in a couple of sentences, this is what I would say. Justification refers to that first moment when you trusted in Christ. You placed your faith in Christ alone for your salvation. And God justified you. He declared you righteous in his sight. Not on the basis of something you did, but solely on the basis of what Christ did for you in his life, death, and resurrection. Now, what's the result of this? Well, there's two things I want to mention. Number one, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven because you have trusted in Christ's work on the cross where he took the penalty for your sin, where he took upon himself 
the wrath of God that you deserved, that should have been yours. Your sins are forgiven. But secondly, the righteousness that Jesus earned in his life of perfect obedience, it's given to you as a gift. It's imputed to you, credited to your account, thereby giving you a righteous standing before God. Do you see this? This is glorious, glorious news. Not only are your sins forgiven, not only is that, that dirty robe taken off, but you are also clothed with a new robe, a pure, clean, spotless robe. You're clothed with the righteousness of your Savior. Now, just to be clear, I want you to notice what this understanding of justification rules out. What does this rule out? I want to point you to three things. First of all, it rules out any belief that justification is a long process over a long period of time, perhaps your entire life, as Catholics would have it. Now, justification is a one-time, instantaneous declaration by God at conversion. It also rules out, secondly, any belief that justification is an internal moral transformation of one's own nature, where the Spirit comes and makes you more and more holy. Now, that's something that's called sanctification that comes next. That's your entire life ahead of you, of being conformed more and more by the Spirit to the image of Christ. That's not justification. Now, justification is that legal declaration of your new status in Christ Jesus. Not guilty, righteous, that declaration. You see the difference? Let me use an analogy or an illustration. Justification, it's not like on what Christ has done, not on the basis of what you have done. And that is where faith comes in. Faith comes right into the picture at this point. Justification happens by faith alone in the work of Christ alone. Let me say that one more time. Justification happens. This declaration is declared upon faith alone, in Christ alone. So, Jesus' blood is the basis on which you are justified, and faith is the instrument, the means through which Justification takes place. Try to imagine this for a moment. There you are, a sinner, separated from Christ under the wrath of God. And then you hear the gospel for the first time, perhaps, about what Jesus has done and, and who he is. And by God's grace, you believe. You believe. You believe in Jesus. 
You trust in Jesus to save you. You're not, you're not trusting in something of your own. No, you're trusting in Him alone. Upon faith, upon, upon that faith in Jesus, God not only forgives your sin, He reckons, imputes, credits the righteousness of His Son to your account. And he, he declares you just in his sight. If I could summarize this, and, and if you don't remember anything, remember this point. If we could just summarize all of this very simply, I would say this. You are justified on the basis of Christ's work alone, by God's grace alone, through faith alone. And aren't the solas of the Reformation just flooding into this? Let me say that one more time. You are justified. On what basis? On the basis of what Christ has done, on the basis of Christ's work alone. How? By God's grace alone. By what means? Through faith alone. Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone. Now, two Sundays ago, we saw the doctrine of Christ alone. In time, we have now seen not only grace alone, but by faith alone. And so what I want to do in the time that we have left right now is draw your attention to faith alone by just looking at one passage. And that is Romans chapter 3. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Specifically verses 21 through 31. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. As we saw last week in verses 9 through 8, Paul exposes our total depravity, our pervasive depravity. The depravity, he says, of all men. No one is exempt. He says in verses 10 through 12, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. We saw that. And after showing us that no one is righteous. What does Paul conclude in verse 20? In verse 20, he says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. In other words, the law does not justify us. Instead, it exposes our sinfulness. Why? Because we're unable to keep it. The law, it, it brings up, it reveals our condemnation before God. We stand before a holy and righteous God as law breakers. Not law keepers, law breakers. We have violated his command. So Paul can say through works of the law, no person will be justified. 
For there is no one righteous, no, not one. And there's no one, he says, no one who does good, not even one. But there's good news as well. There's good news. Look at verse 21. Verse 21 and 22. Paul says in verse 20, 21 and 22 that the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Though the law and the prophets bore witness to it. But Paul, he's more specific still, isn't he? He says, for it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Jew and Gentile. Well, all have sinned. All have fallen short of God's glory. Paul says in verse 25, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And listen to what he says next. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Do you see it? Do you see faith alone right there in the text? But Paul's not done. Look at verse 26. Paul then says in verse 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be right, he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Notice the emphasis here is not on our works. It's on faith alone. It's through faith in the blood of Jesus that you as a sinner are justified in God's sight. Now, last one doubt what Paul has said, lest we begin to question his emphasis here on justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, Paul is abundantly clear in what he chooses to say next. What does he say next? Look at verse 27. It is because justification is a gift received by faith that no sinner can boast in God's sight. No one. Boasting, he says in ver verse 27, boasting, it's excluded entirely. On what basis, we might ask? It's excluded. Paul asks, is it, is it excluded on the basis of a law of works? No. Paul says, but by the law of faith. And listen to what he says in verse 28. For we hold that no one, that we, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Do you see that? Apart from works of the law. Paul couldn't be more clear. Justification is not by works of the law. Rather, justification is by faith and faith alone. If you are here this morning and you're not a believer in Jesus. Maybe you thought you were, and then you heard the gospel, and you realize this is not at all what I have believed. Or maybe you've never heard the gospel at all, but, and you know 
I don't, I don't believe in Christ. I never have. I'm not a Christian. Let me ask you a question. What is it? What is it that you are trusting in? What is it that you are trusting in to make you righteous before a holy, perfect judge? The common mentality in the world today, and even in Luther's day and Calvin's day, but again today, the common mentality is that, well, if you are a good moral person, you do good things, for the most part, you do enough good deeds, God will let you into heaven. Let me be very clear with you, and I say this to you if you're an unbeliever here, I say this out of love for your soul, out of love for you. This is a lie from the pit of hell. This is exactly what Satan wants you to think. It's exactly what he wants you to believe. How many people, how many people will end up facing eternal condemnation because they thought they could take something of their own and hold it up in front of a holy God? I hope you can see, not just from Calvin or Luther, but from Paul and all the other apostles and Jesus himself, I hope you can see that scripture says the exact opposite, the exact opposite. No one is righteous before God, not even one. No one will be justified by works of the law. No one. So if you're going to go that route, just, just understand you are going against the whole counsel of God, the word of God that he has given. But listen up. If that is you, and you have, you have been trusting in something, whatever it is of your own, that you have lifted up as your own idol, trusting in, in something you have done or you have made or fashioned to somehow make you right before God, if that is you, Hear this. There, there is no one righteous. No one is going to be justified by their works. But listen up. There, there is one. There is one who has obeyed the law. It's not you and it's not me. But there is one. And there's only one. And his name is Jesus. And if you turn away from your sin and repent and then turn to Jesus, trust in Jesus, trust in him alone to save you, you will be justified by God. Your sins will be forgiven. And you will be clothed in the perfect, spotless righteousness of Jesus Christ.
Could there be any better news in the whole world than this? Could there be anything better than this? Listen to Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. I want to conclude this morning by taking you to Jesus himself, to a parable that Jesus gave. And honestly, I cannot think of a better parable than the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, we see bright and clear, we see sola fide, by faith alone. Luke chapter 18. This is what Jesus had to say. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. In other words, a sinner. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray.